I want to introduce our guest, Rajan. Um, Rajan is a longtime friend of uh, Leah Beth and I. We've known him all the way back to the 90s. Um, and we've worked with he and his family in India, and we've known him for years. And, and of course, they've become friends of our church but here because they've been here so often, really, over the last number of years. And they were here, I believe, in February with us, and we're glad to have them back. They're kind of stuck in the U.S. right now because you can't get a flight back into India. So uh, we're sorry for them from that standpoint, but we're really glad that we've had some extra time with them that we normally wouldn't get. So Rajan, if you'll come and share the word, we are really super glad to have you here today again. Thank you, my brother. Love you. What a blessed day it is, amen? amen. Anybody joyful? Amen. We had such a great time worshiping God, and He is here with us where two or three are gathered in His name. He is right here with us, and I believe that God has a message to bless every one of us, fathers especially, but also mothers and everybody, because His Word is powerful. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I truly believe that God has a Word to encourage and lift people up, that we don't need to live under a cloud. We don't need to live with thoughts of defeat and despair, but rather know that the living God is breathing new life, and with Him there's always a fresh start. We are not a prisoner of the past, but we have a living hope in front of us. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Pastor, for giving us this opportunity to be here. And um, today is Father's Day. I love being a father. I didn't know before I got married that first I didn't know anybody would want to marry me. Then I, when God blessed me with my wife, I was astounded. And then he started blessing us with children. And uh, we mar before we got married, the day my wife said yes, we prayed and we said, Lord, give us all the children you want us to have. We'll receive them. And so he gave us only seven. <laughs> so we have seven amazing children, and it has been an exciting time. And uh, I just wish I could stand here and say, I have 12, but maybe <laughs> one day. <laughs> but today... <laughs> But today I want to speak to you on the blessing of the Father. The blessing of the Father. God has given us fathers a very unique and powerful role to fulfill in the lives of our children. How does God see us? I, want, I don't want to see us from where we are today or how we perceive what has happened or has not happened, but what how God sees each one of us fathers. God has a, has a very unique and powerful role for us to fulfill in the lives of our children. We have a divine mandate to impart God's blessings to our children. It is not by might or by power. It is because of the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit inside each one of us. When you received Christ, the Holy Spirit came inside because he's the one who can convict us of sins, open our eyes to the need for a Savior, convince us that we are the righteousness of God in Christ. He does all of that. That's why we don't have to live under, under condemnation from the devil because the Bible, Jesus himself said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict, convict this world of sin, of righteousness and judgment. He convicts us of sins. That's why we recognize we are a sinner. Until then, we thought we are good people. And then he convinces us that we are definitely clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. So every father, I want you to know, you're clothed with the righteousness of God. He gave it. He's not taking it back. And number three, the Bible, Jesus said that, that the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, convicts us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. What does it mean? It means he tells us every day and helps us to see that the devil is indeed defeated and under your foot he is there. He is not sitting next to you. He's not sitting on your shoulder. You, as a child of God, have total authority over the devil. We never need to see that. Amen? 
So as fathers, everyone who believes in Jesus Christ, we must bless our children with the rich legacy of the things of God so that they will want to follow Jesus. Amen. That's all God wants us to Share with them. Bless them with the rich legacy of God that inside them God will ignite that passionate desire and thirst to follow him. Today we are going to look at a text where we are going to see a father who imparts his blessing to his sons. Our text is find, found in Genesis chapter 49. Uh, let me give you the background. In Genesis chapter 49, we see Jacob. He's now in Egypt where his son is second in command next to Pharaoh. The time has come that Jacob knows he's dying, so he brings his sons together, all 12 of them. And he takes time to speak blessing upon each one of his sons. And the verses that we are particularly focusing on in Genesis 49 is the blessing he spoke upon Joseph, who was, birth, who was born to him through his beloved wife Rachel. Now, while Judah received the higher blessing that the Messiah will come through his family line, when it came to Joseph... The full blessing starts coming out. It's almost like the floodgates open and blessings are gushing out like torrent. The word bless is found six times in verses 25 and 26. What do we read, understand from this? That God wants to impart his blessings to his children. God wants to impart his blessings to his children, all of us. And we as earthly fathers look at the role model of our heavenly father and we do the same. Amen. I want to draw your attention to Genesis chapter 49, beginning with verse 22. Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a well or a spring. His branches run over the wall. The archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him, hated him. But his bow remained in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel, by the God of your father who will help you. And by the Almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the breast and of the womb, blessings of your father have excelled the blessings of my ancestors. He's talking about Abraham and Isaac. Up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills, they shall be on the head of Joseph. And on the crown of the head of him who was separate from his brothers. Then he talks about his brother. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey and at night he shall divide the spoil. All these are the twelve tribes of Israel. And this is what their father spoke to them and he blessed them. And he blessed each one according to his own blessing. What a great passage of scripture that Jacob took the time to bless his children. There are four important lessons God wants us to draw from this passage that he wants us to inculcate in our personal lives. Today is a new day. Today is a day of victory. Today, whatever has happened before, we can, through the help of the living God, start afresh. First, we bless our children by helping them understand life or interpret life in the light of God's perspective. Amen. We bless our children by helping them to understand life or to see life or interpret life in the light of God's perspective. It's so easy to look at things from a natural perspective, but as believers, we have been given this exclusive privilege of looking everything from the, through the eyes of God. So when, first, Jacob uses the imagery of a fruitful vine. 
planted by a well. By using this imagery, he's describing Joseph's present condition, where he's been blessed, he is exalted, he's the number two man in Egypt. Second, he uses the imagery of an archer under attack to describe what happened in Joseph's life in the past. And then he ties these two imageries together to show the reason for Joseph's present fruitfulness. There's fruitfulness in Joseph's life, but it's not exclusive, one or the other. Both of them were important. God was behind both of them. God is the one who ordered Joseph's footsteps. Him going to Egypt, whatever his brothers did, God was there. He protected him even though those things happened. So first is what happened in the, in the, in the present right now. Second is what happened in the past. These two imageries are tied together to, to show Joseph's present fruitfulness because he endured the past trials with the strength of God. Amen. Trials will come. It'll come to every person, fathers, especially as fathers, as you carry the responsibility in your marriage, in your, with your family. Don't be afraid of trials. Why? Because we have God on our side. The Word of God says, if God be for you, then who can be against you? He that did not spare his own son for you, how much more? Say it with me, how much more? One more time, how much more? And now you need to say it with a big smile. How much more? <laughs> Through him, he will freely give us all things. You have God on your side, amen? So we don't need to be afraid of trials. Then Jacob goes on to describe God through five different titles as he invokes future blessings on Joseph. Jacob is not telling Joseph anything new. As he was going through these trials, Joseph had already realized that what his brothers meant for evil, God meant it for good. Even when Joseph was falsely accused, imprisoned, forgotten, he knew that God is sovereign and he is in control. All here Jacob does is affirm that Joseph's interpretation or understanding of his life is from God's perspective. He's saying that Joseph is fruitful because he went through those trials with the strength of the Lord. We need to learn that. That we don't look at challenges that come our way and sigh and give up and feel like why, but rather we should know we can face any challenges from a position of victory. We never face a challenge from a position of weakness. We do not face a challenge from a position of defeat. Rather, we face every challenge on the authority of God's Word with a perfect joyful knowledge that he is walking in the fire with us and he will bring us out. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Because as we go through those trying times, whatever it is, it can be raising the children, it can be challenges from others or finances or demonic attacks, we will come through it and it will always result in fruitfulness. Somebody raise your hand. Say this with me. Lord. Ah, now we're talking to God. Come on, big smile. Lord, make me fruitful. Hallelujah. Then Jacob moves on and uses this illustration of metaphor of a boy whose father is teaching him how to shoot a bow and arrow. The boy is not strong enough to pull the bow back all the way and hold it steady on the target. So the father wraps his arms around the boy, pulls his strong, puts his strong hands over the boy's hand and pulls back the bow string and aims it at the target. What happens at this point? The boy is a strong archer because of his father's strength. This is a picture. This is what Jacob is telling 
his son. So this is a beautiful picture of how we are strong because in our weakness, God wraps his hand around us and helps us to use the spiritual armor he has given us, helps us to pull it and send the arrow to the target, which will result in victories and miracles. So whatever is the area that the enemy is attacking you, the enemy is sending his fiery darts, God says, take the armor that I have given you. Lay hands on it. You do not know how to use it. Look to me. I will put my arms around you and I'll pull the bowstring and I will help you release that arrow to reach the target. We are strong. Today God is telling us fathers, that our strength comes from the Lord. It is not from our education. It's not how much money we have or our past experience. Today is a new day. The Holy Spirit has been given to us to help us in every circumstance. Somebody said, hallelujah. Hallelujah. There are three lessons found just in this area. The first lesson is fruitfulness. God wants all of us as children to be fruitful. We need to encourage our children to be fruitful. Fruitful, being fruitful is biblical. Being fruitful is God-centered. Rather than successful, which is man-centered. There's two important, big distinction. People often tend towards the successful part. But God says fruitful. Remember, he tells Joseph, his son, you are a fruitful wine. He uses those words. It's an inspired blessing. Fruitfulness is what we need to focus on. Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 5, I am the vine. You and I are not the vine. He is the vine. We are the branches. He has allowed us or attached us to him. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. What a great God we serve. He is an all-sufficient God. Everything that is lacking in our life, he has it in abundance. And when we are abiding in him and he is abiding in us, what's in him will flow into our lives. If today you need a strategy for something, he will give it to you. If there is a challenge with a child, he will show you how to Speak to the child, how to encourage the child, how to reach the heart of the child. He is able because he knows exactly what to do. And he says, abide in me and I'll make you fruitful. Just as Joseph was a fruitful vine that ran over the wall. See, there's an imagery again here. He's a fruitful vine, but it ran over the wall. The wall are the Egyptians. That means not only was Joseph blessed, but now the Egyptians are blessed because Joseph is a fruitful vine. They escaped the famine because of this man, and their nation is progressing well. So too, we need to teach our children that to be, to be fruitful, not in their own lives with God, but also to reach out to others with the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of the great privileges living in this nation is you have people from every nation already here. There is not a U.S. consulate out there whose doors are are without people. There are hundreds of people lined up every day to get a visa to come here. But, you know, you can always let go of that and come through the southern border. But (laughs) So if somebody tells you how bad this country is, just... Get a picture of U.S. consulates across the world. I stood there once upon a time for my student visa. 200 of us were standing there just to get in. But anyway, to get a visa. So I'm encouraging you that God wants us not only to be blessed in our lives, but to always take the opportunity to tell others about Jesus. You meet people from all over the world. You can meet Chinese, there are Russians here, you know, there are people from India. Go to an Indian restaurant, you know, talk to them about the Lord, you know. It's worth eating that hot food if you can win that soul. And, (laughs) 
You know, the, 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 the Korean people run all kinds of dry cleaning places, a great place to go pray with them. I do that all the time. So I encourage you to constantly look for, but take your children with you so that they can see how to share Christ with others. How you can pray for anybody. Two days ago, I, not yesterday, I had a challenge with my tires, and I had to get one change immediately. And um, by the grace of God, this particular place had the tire I needed, and I was there, and they got the work done. And I looked at the man and said, hey, can I pray for you? He looked at me for a second because he did not look at me what type of prayer I'm going to pray and who I'm going to pray for. <laughs> and he said, okay. And uh, so I reached out my hand, held his hand, and began to pray for him in the name of Jesus. And after I was done, he said to me, that prayer is going to it could take care of me for the next two days. And later on, I found out he does know Christ, and we had a great conversation. You never know where God will use you. We need to be like Joseph, a fruitful vine run over the wall. Amen. The second thing that we observe from this particular passage is that strength comes from God. Strength comes from God, not from ourselves. Ephesians 6, verse 10 and 11. Finally, my brethren. I like the way he says this. Finally. The, the, that's the last chapter. And now the apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wants to bring this thing again to the people. He's going to close the letter. He says, this is a very important word from God. You need to remember it. Just don't let it go. Need to remember it. Hold to it. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. It's a very beautiful scripture, simple line, but what does it mean? The might of God continuously puts out the dunamis power of God. That's a tangible, demonstrative power. The dynamic power of God keeps coming constantly from the muscular might of God. But this power must be poured into a vessel. The word strength, if you look in the original language, implies that there has to be a container into which the power should go. You and I are the containers God has been molding since we were born again. So when this power, dynamic, dunamis power of God is poured into the container of this frail vessel, something happens. It turns into a dynamic, supernatural strength. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This strength is, is inexhaustible. It's there constantly. You can never use it. It's never rationed out. You and I can constantly draw from the strength. Anytime you feel weary, anytime you feel tired, you are aching. We need to remember the scripture and say, God, you made me a vessel into which you've already poured your dynamic power. I want your supernatural strength now. Supernatural strength for every day, every hour, especially as we are going through troubled times, God says we will have strength. Now, Joseph's vine is fruitful because it is planted near a spring. This word spring means that God himself is Joseph's source and he's sustaining him in every circumstance. So throughout his life, from the time he was sold, thrown into the pit and sold to the merchants and on into Egypt, God has continuously been in his source, a spring deep underneath. He was connected with God. The roots went into the moist soil and nourished him in times of drought. Over 20 years in prison, you know, God nourished him during the time of drought and famine. The archer under attack was strong because the mighty hands of God were placed upon his hands. And we need to teach our children that our strength doesn't come from us, what we know, what we have, but it comes daily, daily, continuously, in abundance from our living God. Our children need to see us fathers go to God for strength from his word. Our children must see us read the word, speak the word, apply the word to our circumstances. We, they need to see us praying 
to possess God's promises and lay hold on the unlimited resources that God has. <laughs> Hallelujah. Our children should see it. You haven't done it? You can do it today. You can start fresh. And God is with you. I remember as I was growing up, one of the reasons I, I, I knew God, the most primary reason, you know, of course, the word, but the way I knew God heals is when I was about six years old, my father was paralyzed for 40 days. He was laid flat on the bed. At the end of 40 days, God did a miracle and raised my father up. When I came home from school that day, I saw my dad get up from that bed, unassisted, walk across the room, and then walk back. When he came to the middle of the room, he turned and looked at me, and he said these words, God healed me. That was forever inscribed into my heart and my spirit. And that's how I know God heals. And I've never stopped praying for people. It doesn't matter what their need is. I know. I know that I know that my Jesus raised my dad out of that bed after 40 days. And he had a fruitful life. That's the kind of miracles God will do in your life and in my life. And our children see it. I saw it. I believe. Now, my seven children, we are prayed for them every time. It doesn't matter whether small or great. Prayed with them for their miracles. And they know that Jesus heals. Amen. And I'm confident that my grandchildren, I, I encourage them all to have at least seven children. So we're looking at 49 grandchildren. And... <laughs> Those 49 grandchildren will know that Jesus is a savior, healer, protector, supernatural provider who will give them victory in every area of their lives. Amen. And I'm praying for my grandchildren because I want them to teach my great-grandchildren. By now, the number should be about four or five times. <laughs> Possess the earth. <laughs> Our children, it's okay for our children to see times when we are weak. To know times when you are not sure what's the right thing to do. But then they see that the God that Father believes is the living God in whom we can trust because He is mighty. That's where our children learn that our God is mighty. I can be weak, but my God is always strong and mighty. Amen? Amen? Jeremiah 17, verses 7 and 8. I'm reading to you from the Amplified Bible. Most blessed is the man who believes in, trusts in, relies on the Lord. Look at this line. Whose hope and confidence the Lord is. It's not like my hope is in the Lord. God himself is our hope. God himself is our confidence. Really takes it to a new level. For this man who believes God shall be like a tree planted by the waters that spreads out its roots by the rivers. It shall not see and fear when he comes, but its leaf shall be green. It shall not be anxious or full of care in the year of drought nor shall it cease yielding fruit. What a powerful scripture. You are planted by God himself, by his waters. Hallelujah. You are a tree planted by the waters and you grow because God is in you. He is abiding in you. You are putting out big branches and leaves producing fruit. It says you will not fear. Or see heat when it comes. The enemy can launch the, the most powerful weapon he has in his arsenal. It will not do anything to you. You will be invincible. That's what it says here. You shall not see or fear when heat comes. And your leaf shall be green. You will not wither away. Why? Because you're nourished by God. That's what happened with Joseph. And the God who Joseph believed is our God today. You're not going to wither. You're not going to crumble. You and I are not going to fold. But the Bible says we will not be anxious or full of care. Why? In a year of drought, there can be drought in the land for a year, but you will bear fruit. Because it is God who is sustaining us. 
Third lesson is trials. A godly life doesn't mean we are exempt from trials. Fruitfulness often comes through trials. You know, Joseph was most godly among Jacob's sons, yet he's the one who suffered most. He was attacked by his brothers. Potiphar's wife shot at him through her temptation to commit adultery. Potiphar threw him in jail. Cupbearer forgot his promise to mention Joseph to Pharaoh. And yet, Joseph came through all these trials without any bitterness against God or towards anyone who had wronged him. How is it possible? Because he trusted in the loving God, his sovereign God. Our children need to know that while following God has his blessings, there are also trials. Trials never weaken us. We come out stronger out of every trial. We come out with greater victory. We come out knowing that we have great authority over the enemy and that God's word will never change. Amen? We need to communicate this through our own example To bless our children is to help them see life, interpret life, even trials that come in life from God's perspective. The second thing that we receive from these words, from this passage is to bless our children, we must walk in personal relationship and reality with God. There needs to be the reality of God, not a token understanding, not a distant understanding, but a reality of who our God is. The greatest thing that we as fathers can do, and also mothers, can do to our children is to to help our children to go on with God is for us to walk in the personal reality of God. We are not perfect people. There is imperfection. But God is not looking and focusing on the perfection. He's looking to see if you will trust him in the midst of all of our challenges. One of the reasons this scripture is so amazing is because of Jacob himself. If anybody has read through the life of Jacob, you know this man was, if somebody is supposed to have problems, he had everything. He was called a deceiver. Even his mom and dad name him like that. He's a deceiver. You know, nobody names their children like that. But, you know, that's the level of their faith maybe. I don't know. But <laughs> he, he was not a perfect man by any means. But he had relationship with God. There were ups and downs in his life. In spite of his problems, Jacob knew God personally. That was where the victory was. It was not on him. It's not because he was Abraham's grandson. It's because he knew the God of Abraham. So I encourage you today not to focus on yourself. Look how he describes God. In these scriptures, he describes God through five different names. He calls God, he boldly calls God, or as he's talking, blessing his son Joseph. He says, the mighty God of Jacob. He doesn't say mighty God somewhere. The mighty God of Jacob. He's talking about his God. Then he says, the shepherd. God was his shepherd. He took him, watched over him, and he made the 500-mile journey from his father's tent to where Laban was. God was his shepherd, protecting him from all the craftiness of Laban himself. God is his shepherd. And then he tells him, the stone of Israel. Another name he gives God, the stone of Israel. God gave him the name Israel, but he says Israel is who he is because he's built on that stone. It's because of God I can be Israel. It's because of God you are who you are. And then he says, the God of your father, he tells him. Years before, Jacob referred to God as the God of his father and the God of Abraham. But now he calls him his God. He, then he says, God is almighty, meaning no folk can prevail against his God. All these words, all these titles he's using to describe his relationship with God. What does it mean? He learned on practical terms the goodness of God, 
the miracles of God, the divine interventions of God. That is where these names of God are coming from inside him. We need to know our God as our Savior. We need to know him as Jehovah Shama, God who is with us all the time. Jehovah Rapha, our healer. Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Jehovah Shalom, God our peace. Jehovah Sitkinu, God our righteousness. Hallelujah. That his banner over us is love. He is Jehovah Rohi, our shepherd. He is everything to us. It is time that we begin to experience God in, our, in, in all of his power. That we know the reality of God. You know, when Jacob was going through all these troubles in his life, his children were watching it. They were there with him and he had to run away from Laban. They knew that Laban was following with, with a big group of people. They knew that. They knew Esau was coming. They were there that night when their father divided them in groups because they probably felt the same fear. My father is fearful, so I'm fearful. They saw those shortcomings, yet they also saw that their God, that their father believed in God. Look at some other things happened, the crisis in his life. Jacob was a schemer, but God taught him that his schemes were worthless. God had proven himself mighty by protecting Jacob from the anger of Esau, his brother, and Laban, both of them wanted to kill him. But he protected him. He's a mighty God. Nobody can touch you until the day God takes you home. And again, God proved himself mighty in keeping the Canaanites from attacking Jacob after his two sons slaughtered the Shechemites. The whole Groups of people could have ganged up, but God protected him. God led Jacob as a shepherd, protecting him from danger, guiding him in paths of righteousness. And in verse 24, he uses the word from there. Then he talks about shepherd. He uses the term from there. It's an emphatic way of saying that God is the source of everything, and it is proven through the names he is using. From our God force your, flows your strength, your provision, your hope, your victory. And your children's lives will be transformed because he is the source. So through the trials of the loss of Joseph, in the midst of the famine, probably Joseph and Jacob thought, I will die. Maybe all my family will die in Canaan because of the severe famine. Yet Jacob, in the midst of his fears, made a choice to rely on God, his rock, a sure foundation whom he could turn, stand firm in. Jacob knew that God was not only his help, but he is also the one who can help his sons. Look what he says in verse 25. He says, the God of your father helps you. So Jacob knew God helps him, but he was also confident that the same God will help his children, his sons. Sometimes as a father, you may feel limited. You may, not be, you may feel like, oh, I wish I could do it, but I'm unable to do it. But don't worry. Entrust your children in the hands of God. This is an important lesson of faith for us parents as us fathers. When we learn that God can be our God and also can be the God of our children, then we can entrust our children into his hand. Amen. Today, some of your children may have grown and gone away. And you're concerned about their lifestyle or their love for God or are they walking with God. Don't allow those fears and doubts to overwhelm you. Entrust your children in the hand of God. Pray in faith Amen. for the rebellion to leave, for the disobedience to leave, for the spiritual darkness to be peeled off their lives and the forces of darkness to be defeated. Amen. There is no distance in prayer. Just like Jacob said, the God of your father helps you. You need to know, my God will help my children. Amen. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, I encourage you to believe in God every day for all that you need. You know, I forgot to pray for that clock. Okay, just a few minutes. In order to bless our children, we need to observe their strengths 
and point them out to them. Our children are a gift from God. They are God's workmanship. Our children will not be the same. You know, not everybody is the same. You, you know, I see the differences in my children, and it's wonderful because God made them unique. The joy of being a parent is to get to know the children, is to see their strengths, is to appreciate their strengths, to point out their strengths. And of course, there are times when there needs to be correction too. But do it from a perspective of what is pleasing to God. And if you do not know, ask the Holy Spirit. He will never let you down. Never let you down. Speak over your children what God has shown you about them. Before each one of our children were born, I would spend hours praying, Oh God, what is the name we should give this child? And God would give us the names. If you are, going, if you are about to have a child or you have, you're going to get married and have children, pray. Ask God to give you the right names and he will give you the names. And that will set the stage for what their life is going to be. Because God is involved. The last point. To bless our children, we must impart to them spiritual blessings above all else. Amen. To bless our children, we must impart spiritual blessings. Now, I'm going to go back and read Genesis 49, verses 25 and 26. This is part of the words that are inspired words of blessing coming out of Jacob's mouth. I'm going to read to you from the Amplified. By the God of your father, he's telling Joseph... Who will help you? And by the Almighty, who will bless you with blessings of the heavens above, blessings lying in the deep beneath, blessings of the breast and the womb, blessings of your father on you. Watch these words. Blessings of your father on you are greater than the blessings of my forefathers. That is Abraham and Isaac that was on me. And are as lasting, the blessings he says, I'm speaking over you, are as lasting as the bounties of the eternal hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph, on the crown of his head, who was consecrated and separated from his brethren, and the one who is prince among them. As you read these words, it looks as if that jo Jacob is speaking material blessings upon his son. Because he, of the words he uses, he mentions blessings of heaven above, meaning, you know, they are, you, you, they are by, 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 by vocation shepherds. They raise a lot of cattle. You know, they till the ground. So they need rain and sunshine. So blessings from heaven. Blessings of the deep may refer to springs. When they cut wells, water comes. Blessings of the breast and womb may refer to children and multiplication of flocks and herds. And in verse 26, he says, the blessings he is bestowing on Joseph is greater than what Jacob received from his grandfather and his father. So his prayer, in these prayers, he now says they are as great, that these blessings are great as the mountains or the eternal hills. So what is, what is that comes to our mind when you think about a mountain or a hill? It's stable. It's there. It's firm. It's established. It's not going to move. So he's telling him, Something more. That the implication here is not just mere temporal blessings, but the everlasting blessings that come from God. Now, he knows that jo Joseph is the second in command. As far as material wealth, he has everything. Nobody can give him any more. Anything that Joseph wanted, he already had. He had lands, whatever, servants, anything. He had everything. But he's praying. Jo Jacob is praying that his son would experience the unlimited blessings of the covenant promises of God, which is in contrast to the riches that Egypt has given him. That's what we need to pray for our children. God's promised blessings are greater than anything the world can offer us. God's promised blessings are greater than anything the world can offer us and offer our children. Say that with me. God's promised blessings. Oh, now, come on. You should say it with more joy in your heart. Be shouting by now. Come on. God's promised blessings are greater than anything the world has to offer. As fathers and mothers, 
We must believe and trust God. Not encouraging our children just to pursue a worldly success ahead of the blessings of God. There has to be a real distinction because we are not like the rest of the world. There are temporal, there are worldly success, but it cannot come above the blessings of God. If we are just pushing our children to a career, how to make a lot of money and bring them status and fame, then we are really losing. Our focus as believers is to help impart God's blessings upon our children. We need to give them as heroes, the great men and women of God who have served God, taken the gospel to the nations of the earth and who put God first and therefore they were successful because their success was not limited just to this earth. It is eternal. I'm thinking of the lady who came from Ireland all the way to my nation. Took her a long time. People could have looked at her life and said, you know, so much of your life, young life was wasted. It was not. She was heading towards the destination God had for her. She made it to India. And then one day, in the midst of all that she is doing, God leads her to minister to a few children playing in the street, which she was faithful to do. And then one little girl receives Christ. Comes from a Hindu home. Tells her family, I received Jesus. They could not believe. What a tragedy this is to them. They believe this is the most shameful thing that could have ever happened to the family. She had to leave home because of her faith in Christ. But this lady took her in and raised her and got her married to a Christian man. And that little girl became my grandmother. True success. She was instrumental in so many people coming to know Jesus Christ and my grandmother, and because of my grandmother, her children, five children, were born again, filled with the Spirit, living for God, and several of the grandchildren today are serving the living God. You see how it works? We need to help our children to know what is real success. Because anything we acquire in the world, we cannot take anything with us but souls. Rich harvest of souls. So the question is, are we as Christian dads, our believers in Christ, imparting God's blessing to our children? How can we do it? We do it because the Holy Spirit is living inside you right now. His name is Comforter. He came from God with a job description to live in you forever and to help each one of us in every task we have, especially raising the children. You don't need to go into a, a, get a book to do it. We need to pray over our children. If it needs, you need to fast so that God changes their lives. Amen. There is nothing that can stand before a father or a mother who are praying and fasting and speaking life over the children. Your children will arise and possess the gates of the enemy and deliver people from the hands of the enemy. Hallelujah. Not because we are perfect. We are earthen vessels. But the Bible says inside this earthen vessel is the treasure of God. The Holy Spirit is inside you. And all that God has is inside you. But we need to take authority over our thoughts. Thoughts of despair, defeat, wasted years. What does God say? The years that the canker worm and palmer worm has eaten, I will multiply it back to you. So don't dwell on the past. Let God's words begin to soak into your heart and mind and change your perspective. We're not going to look back. God says, forgetting those things that are behind, press forward. Press forward. What we have is today. What we have, we have is tomorrow. But right now, what are we doing today? We can take authority over all of this negativity that the enemy is bombarding us with and command it to go. And get out and say, Lord, I submit my mind to you. Help me to be a godly father like Jacob was. In all of, with all of his faults, he trusted you. If this man can trust you, I can trust you. If you can be the God of Jacob, the stone of Israel, God Almighty, the shepherd, his God, you are my God. I am built on you, Lord. You are my shepherd. You are my God Almighty. And I refuse to yield control of my children to the hands of the enemy. 
and I will bring and impart God's spiritual blessings into my children because when the spiritual blessings are in operation, the temporal blessings will take care of itself because the God we serve is the God who blesses. Do you believe that? Come on, raise your hand. Say this with me. Thank you, Jesus, for your goodness in my life, for my children, for my future children, grandchildren. I pray that you'll anoint me, touch me, cause your word to come alive in my life that I may speak life over my children, life over my family. With your help, impart spiritual blessings that my children and my grandchildren and my generations will serve you, honor you, bring you glory today and every day. Amen. Come on. Anybody joyful? What a great God we serve.